Hey, welcome to my devlog. I'm Dustin, and I'm coding a 3D stealth action game from scratch. This is Blender's new asset browser. I'm using it. This is skeletal animation code that I solved the bug for. And this is the game. It's looking pretty good. Let's talk about it. So the next version of Blender will add an asset library feature. That's what's at the bottom of the screen. I created a library out of all of the assets I've created so far, and now I can freely drag them into my levels. I'll be able to block out levels using actual finished art now, rather than using placeholders. The levels still need a ton of work to be game ready, but I can see how everything looks as I go, and that'll save a lot of time. It's a pretty awesome feature, and I'm looking forward to the official release, as it's currently in beta. Next up, I solved a long-standing bug. The skin of the character periodically jumps around, glitches, or disappears. You may have noticed it in a few devlogs or in progress updates I posted on the Discord. The reason turned out to be related to my engine design. My engine works with vSync by creating a rendering model that contains all rendering data at the end of every game loop. If the screen wants to draw a frame, it grabs the latest model and draws it. This way my engine can run at a higher speed than the screen's refresh rate, but the GPU won't be producing heat or using power. The renderer can also drop frames if the model hasn't changed. Now, the bug happened because my skeleton is a class, or pointer to memory. When I pass it to the rendering model, the simulation kept changing it, while the model attempted to resolve the kinematic structure of the joints. I couldn't solve it because... When I inspected everything, the joints were always technically correct. They were just being updated by two different threads at the same time. This bug was a multi-threading bug, one of the hardest to diagnose. To fix it, I simply copy the joint positions into the rendering model instead of passing the skeleton pointer, which made everything work perfectly. It feels great to finally have this one fixed, as it was a stressful, nagging bug that just wouldn't go away. So here we are. This is what the game looks like right now. A few of you have been asking me to add sound effects for some time now, and I went ahead and added a few. The door sound in particular took me an entire day. It's a collection of different sounds that I retimed and matched together. The lock and click at the end was actually a few seconds of an elevator door closing that I sped up and applied filters to. I think it sounds pretty awesome. Since this game is all about going through doors, I wanted the doors to feel good to pass through. You should feel good for getting to this point. I've also continued to tweak the visual appearance. There's an intelligent color restriction taking place, which limits the range for parts of the render. I think it adds a lot to the retro feel that I'm going for. I've also improved the camera's intelligence. It'll now attempt to stay within the current room, and has much more improvements to the calculations for when players are obscured by objects in the game level. I've also added shadows to point lights. The orange light next to the player is a point light. I did this by using two 180 degree spotlights that are back to back, which the rendering model takes care of for me. The engine itself still only sees it as a single point light. If we turn on light locations, you can see two spotlights where each of the point lights should be. However, the gun muzzle flash effect consists of a non-shadow casting point light, and this stays a point light because it's still more efficient than two spotlights. Since it's not casting shadows, it doesn't need to be spotlights. The muzzle flash also contains a regular shadow casting spotlight. Now, I want to talk about performance tools real quick. My fellow game dev Skeffles is working on his own tower defense game. He's coding it himself because he's awesome. In one of his recent devlogs, he talked about finding performance issues in his engine. And while recording this devlog, I just happened to find an example in my own engine. You may have noticed the character stutters a little while he's running during this devlog. 
we're actually dropping frames because something is taking up way too much time. My profiling code is simple. It grabs a timestamp from every system, sorts them by duration, and puts them in this menu. If I click the menu while we're running, you'll see audio is using a massive amount of time. This is super weird because I'm not playing any audio while we're running. Now, I'm not going to solve this issue right now because I want to finish this devlog, but I do know exactly where the time is being used and under what conditions. It's the audio system and it's while we're running. Finding the problem and fixing it would be a piece of cake, thanks to my profiling code. The last thing I want to talk about is open source. I've come to realize that those of you who want to contribute financially to me right now are interested in the code. So I've decided to start dividing my engine up into pieces. I plan to release each piece as fully open source, which means you'll be able to use it to make your own games if you want. Now to be clear, this won't contain my games. It will, however, make building games in Swift much easier. After getting my first patron supporter, Smibzy, who is contributing extremely generously, I had an unexpected upturn in motivation and happiness. I didn't realize how different I'd feel about my hard work when I was actually getting paid to do it. So shortly, I will begin distributing and maintaining my source code on GitHub, with the condition that enough of you support the effort. You'll be supporting me and my games, and the source code will be free for everyone to use with a non-restrictive license. The first package I'm going to release will be Game Math. This package will contain all of the types and math my games use. This package is fundamental for pretty much every other package I'll ever release, so it makes sense that it'll be first. The second package is something new I've been working on. I'm making it extremely simple to create a new window and draw fully textured 3D objects on every operating system with the exact same code and assets. This means writing code on Windows will work on Linux and Mac OS without changing anything. I'll be making a separate video about this sometime soon as it's kind of fantastic. If I get enough supporters, I'll also consider tutorial videos on using Swift and for using each of these packages. So if you're interested in any of this or just want to support me, then head on over to my Patreon. Link in the description. Anyway, that's it for this devlog. Thanks for watching, kill your lifts, and I'll see you next time.